Thank you. Well, I'm delighted to be here um, and very excited about this next panel. So earlier this morning, we heard about the impact of the changes to the WIC package on the participants in WIC. And now we'll be hearing more about another group of important stakeholders, the stores and the vendors. And I think it's really important for each of these large public health initiatives to not only look at sort of the the downstream impact, meaning on the individual's behavior, but the upstream impact, looking at the larger system. So just as we want to look for um, menu labeling, how does it affect people's ordering behavior at restaurants, we also need to look at how does it affect what the restaurants offer in the first place. So um, in a parallel way, we'll be hearing about how the program change has affected the vendors and the overall food environment with the optimistic notion that it will improve the food environment, which will benefit everyone, not just those participating in WIC. So we have four speakers who will be presenting studies from all across the country um, using multiple methods, and I'll introduce each one briefly and where they're from. So our first is Jackie McLaughlin, who is the Associate Director of the MPH program at the University of Pennsylvania and a registered dietitian. And she will be presenting a study that her group conducted in Philadelphia. Next will be Dr. Tanya Andreeva, who is an economist who works with me at the Rudd Center. She's the director of our economic initiatives, and she'll be presenting a study that we did in Connecticut. Third is Dr. Angela Odoms-Young, who is an assistant professor of kines kinesiology. <laughs> I can't even say kinesiology. I was, I was so glad I was pronouncing names right, and then I stumble on that. Um, and nutrition at the University of Illinois at Chicago, and she'll be presenting a study that they did in northern Illinois. And finally, um, Stacy Gleason, who is a senior policy associate at the Altarum Institute in their policy planning and evaluation area, and she'll be presenting a four-state study that includes Colorado, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. So we'll start with Jackie. Good morning. It's nice to see uh, a full room here this morning. I have to tell you that my colleague Amy Hillier, who is the PI on this uh, team effort project, um, came down with me last evening. We checked in about 11 o'clock. Um, and um, she was actually going to do the presentation today, so these are her slides. And um, she got a phone call that uh, one of her cats was sick and they needed to put the cat down. So she was a little upset about that and turned around, hopped a train back to Philadelphia last night. So you're stuck with me. <laughs> and I will stumble through her slides and hopefully be able to um, fully address your questions if you have any questions. The first slide shows the team. Um, that we've been working with on this project. Um, and we definitely have a collaboration across universities um, and uh, with nonprofits, with the Food Trust in Philadelphia. You see all of our research assistants that have worked on this project. We also have um, pictures of a couple of our researchers who are partners in our community-driven research, members of the community that are engaged in doing a variety of research projects with us, and also Linda Kilby Brooks, who is the director for the WIC program in Philadelphia. And it was truly, has been a very fruitful and um, positive relationship that we all have with each other. Uh, basically, our, our project was taking a look and evaluating at the impact of the food package changes in two neighborhoods in Philadelphia. Um, let me talk about the design a little bit. Uh, we had two contiguous zip codes in Philadelphia, and they are marked on the map with the red squares. Um, it, we had uh, a pre- and post-test design, and our um, hypothesis was that these WIC food package changes would favorably affect the food environment by increasing access to healthy foods in these two neighborhoods. Um, the neighborhoods are uh, different in composition, so in that total geographic area, there are approximately 70,000 um, families living there, 70,000 individuals there. Um, among the WIC participants, there's a caseload of 12,000 people across those two uh, zip code areas, 
and um, uh, approximately half of those are children. So um, first, initially, what we did was we, um, with the pretest post test, test design, we surveyed all of the food stores. There were pro approximately 150 food stores in both of those zip codes. So we needed all of those, uh, that team of research assistants out there actually going into the field, going into every store, and taking measurements of the food environment in those stores. Um, now, in Philadelphia, there are very few supermarkets within the urban area. And so the landscape in these two neighborhoods consists of a few large supermarkets, some smaller grocery type stores, some convenience stores, but they are predominated with uh, what we call corner stores, uh, which are very small stores that have the footprint of what a typical row house would be in those neighborhoods, um, one cash register, and many of them you know, are very small. Um, <clears throat> also, another bit of information about those um, neighborhoods is that we also um, mapped the distance uh, that folks in those neighborhoods live to stores. So uh, the larger zip code area, let me advance the slide here, oops. I should go back and go through the rest of the study design before I tell you about that. Um, so we interviewed WIC participants. There were about 200 at one of the main WIC sites. There are three WIC sites or three WIC offices that service those two zip code areas. Um, we interviewed the participants who used the WIC offices in our study about their food and shopping um, patterns and behaviors. We also conducted focus groups, two sets of focus groups. We had focus group at baseline before, with the vendors prior to the changes in uh, the food package. And I just completed the focus groups post change um, in October with the vendors. And I don't have that data analyzed yet, but I, I can tell you a little bit about uh, the results of those focus groups. Um, in addition, we did some individual interviews with the small owners, and um, we really were interested in understanding what uh, the impact was of these changes on their businesses. Okay, so this map shows uh, a little bit more detailed demographic information about the two um, neighborhoods. So you're looking at a map of Philadelphia with you know, our two zip codes right there in the middle. And uh, the map with the pink, the study area with the pink, um, is predominantly African American. And the other zip code, the continuous uh, zip code that it joins up to it is predominantly Hispanic. This area that we were looking at is approximately 3.6 square miles in um, so even though you know, they're very close together, they are very um, distinct neighborhoods as well. You can see on the, the blue and the yellow and green map, the um, household income information is there. So they are predominantly in the yellow to light green area with low income families in this area. We used the NEMS instrument, those of you who are familiar with the instrument developed by Karen Glantz, it's a measurement of the food environment. Uh, this one was particular for stores. So we had um, all of our staff trained by Karen and her staff. And what we did was we made some changes to the NEMS instrument uh, to specifically look and be able to measure the food items that were in the WIC food package. We did not um, do this according to specific brands or according to those complicated and difficult sizes um, that some people are dealing with uh, because Pennsylvania actually hadn't made those decisions at the time we were doing the baseline um, collection. We just knew what some of the changes were going to be overall for the foods. Um, what we did was we modified the NEM so that we could take measurements of the fresh fruit, fresh and frozen canned vegetables, canned and dried beans, ground beef, ground turkey, canned fish, the, the whole grain breads, WIC approved cereals, tortillas, 
milk, the reduced fat milk, soy beverages, and um, juices. Our primary outcome in this project was really looking at the measurement of the NEM score in, um, and I'll explain a little bit about the NEM scoring. This slide shows you uh, some, some of the um, components of the NEM score. Uh, NEMS, when, it, it, when we're looking at the food environment, we're actually looking at uh, the availability of these food items in the stores. We're looking at the price of the food items, and we're also doing measurements of quality as well. And all of those things, we can look at each one of those things individually or consider them as a whole. So if we look at um, milk, which is the first item up there on the top, I'll walk you through one. Uh, for a store that had reduced fat uh, in Pennsylvania's 2%, they would score two, a two. Um, if they um, had a higher proportion of reduced fat to whole fat milk, they would gain another um, a one. Uh, if they sold a soy milk, they would get a one. Uh, if they had a lower price for the low fat milk to incentivize purchase, um, of that low-fat product, they would get another uh, score of one. Um, and, uh, and if they had a higher price for the lower-fat items, we would subtract uh, numbers from that. So they were penalized in the score um, for having items that were disincentived, uh, disincentivizing the customers to purchase them. Um, so we had four chain supermarkets in our, um, in our neighborhoods, and you can see very obviously uh, here is showing the instrument that the research assistants would use to go through the stores, um, and I explained earlier the type of stores that we had. Um, and 70% of the Hispanic residents live within a quarter mile of a store. 30% um, of the African Americans in the African American neighborhood lived within a quarter mile of the store. And, uh, but overall, across the two zip codes, 50% of the uh, folks in those zip codes were within a half mile of one of these supermarkets. Uh, this shows you sort of the environment of the uh, corner store and one of our research assistants going in and taking the measurements of the environment there. And um, what we did was we had a paired t-test between you know, the pre-test and the post-test scores for the NEMS. And our corner stores were significantly improved after the addition of the WIC food uh, package changes. The overall score was significantly increased um, as well as the availability. Um, we also looked at WIC and non-WIC stores. So both were measured, the WIC stores and the non-WIC stores. And we saw that there were improvements in both environments, not only the WIC stores, but the non-WIC stores as well. But the changes in the WIC stores were greater. Uh, this is, slide just shows you really quickly that um, at the beginning at baseline, um, uh, the number of stores carrying um, reduced fat milk went from 50% to 77%, whole grain bread 33 to 52%. I can tell you, it just add that uh, outcome of the focus groups with the vendors. Several of the vendors are telling us that the clients do, the WIC participants do not want the whole wheat bread. They don't like it and are refusing um, to take it. But um, I don't know exactly how many stores that is and in which of those zip codes yet. Um, the brown rice went from 25 to 50%, 55% being carried in these stores. 100% uh, juice was increased. Varieties of vegetables and fruits were also increased significantly um, in the stores. Um, 
Okay, and looking at the um, least squares regression, what we did was we took a look to see if the type of store influenced uh, whether or not there would be changes in the NEM score. And supermarkets, of course, because they have much greater um, space and variety, um, that was more predictive of the uh, NEM score in year two. Um, we found some interesting information about the Hispanic neighborhoods. So even though the, the uh, folks living in the um, smaller zip code, the Hispanic neighborhood, had more access to stores, they had less access to healthy food. Um, and we found that in our second measurement that the quality of the food environment in those stores had actually increased, so that became less of a significant um, uh, hindrance to access to food. So their access is improving in that neighborhood. Um, and because I'm running out of time, <laughs> I'm at the end, and I just want to um, acknowledge uh, RWJ and Healthy Eating Research, which funded uh, us over the past year. University of Pennsylvania Center for Public Health Initiatives gave us the uh, pilot grant to actually do our baseline um, analysis and data collection. And overall, um, the outcome of this work is that small stores are much more likely to stock healthy food items following the WIC food package changes and that these changes are available to all of the residents in these zip codes. And um, according to the vendors, uh, non-WIC participants are also purchasing these new items that they're stocking. So I'm hoping to, to have those results ready um, soon. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm delighted to be here, and I uh, want to thank the symposium organizers for giving me the opportunity to share findings of our study that we did in Connecticut. So this evaluation uh, was part of a broader study looking at uh, access to healthy foods. So we were interested in basically you know, all factors that are related to um, to the food environment, and I looked at uh, the big, uh, food, the changes in the big uh, food packages, but also at market competition and retailers' perceptions and attitudes, and uh, the role of neighborhood effects in uh, explaining access to healthy food. The study had two components: uh, the store assessment, where we basically went to stores and uh, looked at what foods uh, they had, and we also did interviews with retailers in a subsample of stores that we evaluated. Uh, we did this data collection in Connecticut uh, before and after the change, so in the spring of 2009 and in the spring of 2010, going to the same stores and interviewing the same vendors uh, in both uh, years. So I'll start with the uh, store assessment part, and uh, in uh, designing, in sampling our stores, we started with sampling towns. So in Connecticut, we uh, selected five uh, representative towns, so we wanted to have you know, some diversity in terms of income and also uh, the food uh, retail landscape. So we wanted to have uh, wealthy and poor towns and uh, towns with a lot of supermarkets and uh, a few uh, supermarkets. So we're talking about basically urban and suburban neighborhoods in this study. We didn't have any rural areas. And then in these five towns, we went to all stores, week and non-week, large and small, all stores in these five towns. And we um, identified them using um, data from uh, InfoUS, InfoUSA, and then we used some administrative uh, data from the WIC agency and uh, some field work. So basically, at, the, at our baseline, we had um, more than 300 stores. Only 10 stores refused participation. So it, it wasn't a problem getting into stores to make a uh, an observation. In 2009, we had um, small stores. By small stores, I mean convenience, uh, small uh, stores, uh, food marts, and grocery stores. We had 267, and uh, some reduction in 2010, 259. So basically, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on this group, 259 uh, non-supermarket stores. We also evaluated supermarkets, but for the purpose of the Weak evaluation, we're not interested in this group because we don't expect them to change. 
Um, as Jackie just described, we also used uh, the NAMPS instrument, and she saved me time to explain uh, the instrument. But basically, we modified it to include um, WIC approved foods in the old package and in the new package. So we had 20 categories of uh, foods, you know, all major foods. Um, as a pro and we looked at weak foods as a proxy for healthy foods. And um, we, overall, we had 65 product items. And the reason is that, like, for example, for fresh food, we had 10 uh, different fresh food and 10 fresh vegetables. And for milk, we had all types of milk, soy milk, 1% uh, skim, 2% whole milk. So that's why we have you know, 20 categories and 65 product items. So for all these product items, we, when we went to the store, we looked at whether the product was available at the time of our visit. Then we did a count for whole grains and fruit and vegetables. For, for whole grains, we looked at uh, whole wheat bread and uh, whole grain bread, uh, brown rice and whole grain cereals. So we counted brands and uh, products. And for, whole, for fruits and vegetables, we counted different um, fruits and vegetables, frozen, canned, uh, fresh, uh, those that are approved. Um, for big participants, so not including white potatoes, for example. And for milk, we uh, counted gallons and half gallons of uh, lower fat milk and whole milk, so that we could measure the percentage of lower fat milk in our total milk shelf space. For fruits and vegetables, fresh fruits and vegetables, we uh, measured uh, produce quality, and we used uh, a scale, basically from one to five, excellent quality, fair, you know, very good and so forth. And we trained our uh, raters to be consistent and measured uh, integrated reliability in um, assessing both availability and produce quality. And finally, we also looked at prices. And for uh, prices, we had some reference brands, for example, for infant formula, we just uh, included a brand that was approved, that's approved in the state uh, for weak participants. And for some products, we just suggested go with the cheapest available brand or with the store brand, with the supermarket brand in, uh, in supermarkets. So let's uh, take a quick look at uh, data. And this table gives you uh, the percentage of stores stocking healthy foods, for example, fresh food, whole wheat bread, and brown rice, in 2009 and 2010 in non-weak small stores and weak stores. So again, we're talking just about non-supermarket stores in, um, in this presentation. So in 2009, about half of small stores had some fresh food. So for example, if they had only apples, they would be coded as, yes, they have fresh food. In 2010, no change in non-week approved, in non-week stores, and every week approved small store had at least one fresh food in 2010. So quite a change, uh, because we think of the week revisions. Whole wheat bread, the same story, quite a significant uh, increase and also actually a significant increase in non big stores, which I'll speak later why we think it's the case. Uh, the same for brown rice. So we see just based on this descriptive data that there are quite significant changes in what foods are available in uh, stores uh, to all our participants, big and non big. Then for uh, our count measures, uh, this table gives you the percentage of um, kind of milk shelves space, the percentage of uh, lower fat milk in total uh, milk shelf space. So basically no change for non wig stores and some uh, improvement for uh, wig approved stores. That's what we would expect. And for fruits and vegetables, as a count, 14 different uh, fruits and vegetables were uh, on average available in non uh, wig stores and 19 in 2009 in weak approved stores, 22, some improvement in 2010. The same for whole grain variety. So this means like, let's say three uh, f um, in 2009, on average, a non big store would have brown rice and um, a whole grain cereal, a couple of brands, and um, that would mean three. Uh, variety would, uh, it would be equal to three. Then some improvement in 2010 and a much, much bigger increase in 2010 in week approved stores for all whole grains. So we tried to kind of summarize all this uh, data on availability, prices, uh, variety, and quality, and developed a score 
similar to what uh, Jackie described with the NEMS score, but slightly different. So basically, we assigned points, like each store uh, had um, got some points for having uh, healthy food, and we focused only on four, for 14 uh, food categories. Then some points for having, for example, low, like charging lower prices um, for uh, low fat meal compared to whole milk, having a good quality of uh, produce. So for example, for, uh, so this score could vary from zero to 31, and of course supermarkets had on average about 30 uh, points uh, on the score. And uh, small stores had about 10. And uh, this score was heavily weighted uh, towards whole grains and fruit, uh, fruit and vegetables. And what four means is that the store would have, and it's important to remember that number four because well, you'll see why when I get to our findings. So four uh, on this score means that the store would have skim milk, uh, low-fat milk, so this would be two points, and they would charge, that, uh, that low-fat milk would be cheaper than whole milk, that would be another point, and for example, they would have whole grain, whole wheat fats, that would be another point. So this gives you four points, and um, you know, tells you a little bit about uh, the score. And four was also basically the standard deviation of the mean in uh, smaller stores. So this graph gives you uh, the score that I just described in uh, weak and non-weak stores before and after the change. So what we see for non-weak stores, what we expected, basically not much change, but still there was some improvement, half a point of increase in uh, weak approved stores, again, small stores. So was a significant increase of more than four points in 2010. Uh, we also looked at differences by uh, neighborhood income, and uh, we basically uh, define a neighborhood. Um, a neighborhood is a census tract, and we consider a neighborhood to be a low-income neighborhood if uh, median household income is under 39,000 in that uh, census tract. So this graph, this graph shows you data in low-income, high-income neighborhoods, weak, non-weak stores, again, 2009, 2010. And what you see is that there was a larger gain in the score in weak approved stores located in low income neighborhoods. And of course, you know, that's what we want to see because this is where we have concerns about access to healthy foods. Uh, so in terms of the components of the score, because we were interested, okay, we see this improvement in the score, but what explains it? And basically what this um, table uh, shows you is that whole grains Better availability of whole grains explain, uh, explains uh, why we saw this improvement in the score. Then we did some modeling, of course, and um, this uh, graph shows you, this table shows you data from a linear model for the food score that I just described. The same, basically, the same change of almost four points improvement in uh, weak approved uh, stores after the change, after the weak revisions. And uh, just a summary of some regression regard results, we had like, I don't know, 15 models that we uh, uh, estimated. And basically, this tells you that this improvement in availability of healthy foods in uh, the variety of uh, low, uh, in the variety of whole, uh, whole grains and fruits and vegetables was uh, much better in uh, weak approved stores located in low income neighborhoods. Now, uh, the second part of our study was to do personal interviews with uh, retailers, uh, small, again, retailers, small stores, non-supermarkets. And we interviewed managers or owners of uh, non-supermarkets, and in 2009, we had 68 participants. The response was 75%, somewhat higher in weak approved stores. In 2010, we lost uh, some people, some stores closed, and. Uh, some stores uh, didn't want to participate anymore. And the interview was fairly, uh, was not just on WIC, it was about perceptions of demand, perceptions of profitability of health and, and healthy foods. And basically, we were interested why stores, small stores, uh, uh, stock foods that they do, and uh, whether it was the demand side or the supply side, what problems they had in uh, uh, supplying various foods. And, for uh, today's talk, I just want to focus on their experiences with the uh, WIC revisions. So we interviewed them in 2009, in 2010, the same people, and asked them about um, challenges for WIC, for example. We asked them about challenges in 
uh, implementation of the WIC packages. And uh, most often they mentioned that they had problems with finding suppliers of new products, specifically whole wheat bread and uh, brown rice, as you know, some uh, speakers mentioned before. Uh, they also had problems, and they still have problems, predicting demand. Because they don't, like, for example, with uh, food stamps, every, every, everybody gets food stamps uh, the first day of the month. So you know, okay, so, you know, there will be this spike in demand uh, because people will get their ch checks. And with uh, WIC uh, checks, they don't know, like, basically, retailers don't know when uh, people who live in their neighborhoods get their checks. So they don't know when to expect, when to expect customers to come in and ask for... Um, <coughs> Sorry, for weak foods. And they also had some problems manage, managing customers. So there were some complaints about whole milk and uh, whole grain bread, and that was actually frequent in um, Latin. Sorry, in Latino stores, that uh, customers were not. Uh, some customers, uh, not all, were not happy about um, not having a lot of whole milk, for example, or not having cheese. In terms of changes that our retailers uh, had to implement. Uh, for example, because they had to have fresh fruits and vegetables, so they had to go, most of them, pretty much all of them, use a self-supply. So they go to uh, wholesalers and uh, they buy fruit and, fruit and vegetables. They don't have a retail, uh, wholesalers go, going to, to them and delivering as they do, let's say, with chips or soda. So it's kind of much less convenient for them to provide these foods. So their workload increased and they have to, you know, basically have suppliers come over more frequently than they had before the change. Uh, in terms of profitability, it was a mix. Some of them uh, said they lost money because of the change. Some of them said, wow, we love it, and uh, we are actually making more money now, making much, you know, we have much better profits now because of the change. So it was really a mix. And none of them um, removed products from uh, shelves just to you know, feed weak products. So in terms of providing access to healthy foods, you know, we have to remember that customers still, like everybody still has access to unhealthy foods. And uh, in terms of the overall kind of um, feedback, most of them, 82% in our sample said that uh, they were um, happy or neutral in terms of overall impression, how the big revisions affected their business. This was basically nine months into implementation. Most of them had no complaints. And if they had problems, they solved them within three months. Uh, no store dropped by choice in our sample. So in conclusion, we see a sizable increase in the supply of major healthy foods in WIC approved stores, and that gain is uh, much uh, better in uh, low income neighborhoods. And we also see that uh, vendors in the state of Connecticut, small vendors, uh, were able to adapt to the change fairly quickly. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Angela Odoms Young, and I'm very excited about presenting the results uh, from our study in Northern Illinois. Um, I want to give um, credit to Shannon Zink, who has actually taken the lead on the vendor study that I'm going to present today, and also acknowledge Marion Fitzgibbons. Fitzgibbon, who is a, a co-investigator on the vendor study, but she's also going to talk about our um, study with individual WIC participants. So I'm going to present on the impact of the revised WIC food package on vendor perceptions and fruit and vegetable supply in northern Illinois. In contrast to the previous studies, we looked only at fruit and vegetable availability, so changes in fruit and vegetable availability in the environment. I also would like to acknowledge my other co-investigators uh, on the study, uh, Danny Block, Noel Chavez, and Lisa Powell, as well as our partners at the Illinois Department of Human Services, Penny Roth, Steve Strode, and Jim Armbruster, who have been just wonderful in working with us uh, to accomplish, um, to, to carry out the evaluation. Uh, we all know that policy changes in food assistance provide opportunities to improve diets in low-income families. And one of the things that we were very interested in is not only the individual, but as other speakers, to look at neighborhood-level change 
across different types of communities and determine if the modifications in food assistance policy could actually impact changes in um, or, or create a change in the environment. So we use a mixed method approach similar to the other studies to look at the impact in Northern Illinois and the focus was to look at WIC vendor participation and accessibility, um, fruit and vegetable supply, so availability, selection, quality, and price. And then we also had a qualitative component where we conducted interviews with WIC vendors to look at vendor perceptions post policy. Uh, another um, aim of the study was really to look at differences across neighborhoods. So we had both, both urban and non-urban across our areas, uh, diversity as far as race and ethnicity, um, and ra race and ethnicity as far as neighborhood composition, and also income. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk about the pre and post policy implementations to only selection. I'm not going to talk about price or quality based on time. Um, I'm just going to focus specifically on fruit and vegetable selection. Um, we used a quasi-experimental design uh, where we did a pre and post test uh, with multiple pre-tests. So we were able to get funding from ERS in 2008 to do an initial pretest about one year before the package was put in place. And then we did a pretest right before. Um, we believe that the uh, post policy, um, that there would be a post policy increase in the selection uh, available in smaller vendors as compared to larger vendors. So initially what we thought is that it would have a greater impact on smaller vendors. Uh, and it would also increase the supply in those neighborhoods that were most at risk for low availability, specifically low-income neighborhoods and predominantly African-American neighborhoods. So our setting was Northern Illinois. Um, we looked across a seven-county area um, it includes three uh, of the four largest cities, but we, it doesn't include Chicago. So we included everything outside of Chicago, West Suburban Cook, if you're familiar with Illinois, all the way to Winnebago County, which covers a very diverse area um, of Illinois. So we looked at um, vendors that were authorized to accept WIC, uh, in 2008, 2009, and then 2010. In 2008, we had 314 vendors. We had 345 vendors in 2009, and then 365 vendors in 2010. And similar to the previous studies, we cr um, conducted a direct observation of availability. We didn't use the NIMS, however. We used a, um, a tool that was developed by Shannon Zinc that includes about 100 fruits and vegetables. Um, and it includes white potatoes, but when you look at, when I talk about the measures, we excluded white potatoes. One of the reasons why we decided to select that um, assessment is because we have measures for culturally specific fruits and vegetables versus just commonly consumed. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. So we looked at fresh, uh, canned and frozen, and this analysis only includes the 187 vendors um, that were in all waves of the study, and it excludes pharmacies. So we didn't have a lot of vendor dropout. Uh, a lot of the um, vendors that we excluded from this analysis are actually pharmacies. So as far as measures of selection, we looked at fresh fruits and vegetables. We looked at 21 commonly consumed fresh fruits and vegetables. We looked at 13 African-American specific and 13 Hispanic culturally specific. And these two measures we developed based on previous literature as well as consumption data from national surveys. Uh, we also looked at canned vegetables, canned vegetables with no added salt, fruit with no added sugar, and then frozen fruit with no added sugar and vegetables, um, technically with no added salt. Uh, uh, for canned and frozen, we used, um, and we only assessed a subsample of items um, as compared to the original list. 
So we use fractional logic regression uh, with clustering by store. Um, and we looked at each fruit and vegetable type and selection, which was regressed on time, uh, on store type, and then we looked at the interaction between store type and time. And then we wanted to do a seasonal control. So we looked at days since July 1st of that year. And then we looked at neighborhood characteristics, specifically urbanicity, income, and then racial groups um, with the reference, in, in this case, for example, being white. For our qualitative sample, we use maximum variation sampling because we conducted the study across a seven county area. We wanted to make sure that we got diversity as far as race, income, county, vendor size, uh, et cetera. It was very difficult since we were assessing across a seven county area, we had to conduct the interviews by phone. And if you ever try to call vendors on the phone, particularly smaller vendors, it makes it very difficult. We have very few people refuse, actually. Most of the people we were not able to contact. So we called them, and after 10 attempts, we stopped calling. So some people we were not able to contact, and some said, call me back. I'm very interested, call me back, but we were never able to complete the interview with them in the time period. So we sampled 74 vendors. We only completed interviews with nine of the vendors, and like I said, very few actually refused. Uh, I think we only had two people that refused in the entire sample. Um, we uh, conducted semi-structured interviews by phone, um, so we used a semi-structured guide to allow the vendors to raise issues that were of concern to them versus to guide them um, in their responses. So we gave them some probes and prompts, but we allowed them to raise issues uh, as that were relevant. Uh, we looked at barriers, facilitators, recommendations to improve the policy, uh, as well as any other issues that they wanted to raise uh, directly to IDHS. So we said, if you want to say something to IDHS about the implementation of the policy, feel free to do that in, in this confidential interview. The interviews were audio taped and transcribed verbatim and then input into Atlas, and we used constant comparative analysis to complete that, uh, that uh, analysis. So this just gives a perspective on the mean percentage of items carry post policy. We looked at the commonly consumed, and if you look across store type, you see the pharmacies actually have few fresh, as expected, uh, more canned, but few canned with no salt. So this is actually the proportion of items in this category. So it's the mean percentage of items carried at each of the vendors. Um, few of the, sm the smaller vendors were less likely, of course, to carry fresh, but I think uh, uh, one issue that's particularly interesting is the African-American fresh. When you look at the culturally specific, only in vendors that uh, have one to four registers, they only uh, carried a mean of about 7.3% of the items as compared to larger stores. Thank you. Uh, but when you look at Hispanic fresh, of the culturally specific, really there was a wide variety being carried across the different store types. There was less in the smaller vendors, but they were still available in the smaller vendors. So as far as results, we saw no significant change over time in the selection of Hispanic fresh fruits and vegetables, canned vegetables with no added salt, or canned fruit with no added sugar. But we did see significant increases as compared to baseline. And for this analysis, remember baseline is at 2008. So everything 2010 was compared to 2008. Um, so we saw a significant increase post policy in larger vendors as compared to smaller vendors. Uh, and we also saw an increase in commonly consumed African American uh, fresh canned vegetables, frozen vegetables, and frozen fruit with no added sugar. So when we looked at neighborhood specific um, uh, selection based on um, 
specific neighborhood characteristics, we saw a difference at baseline in some of the neighborhood characteristics. For example, rural communities were more likely to have a greater proportion of canned as compared to fresh. And uh, communities with predominantly Hispanic, uh, a predominantly Hispanic population was more likely to have a greater proportion of those uh, culturally specific fruits and vegetables that were targeted towards Hispanic uh, populations. But unfortunately, in contrast to the other projects, we saw little evidence in change over time. So when you care, compared baseline to post policy, it didn't seem like there was any difference across neighborhoods um, in contrast to what we predicted. We thought those neighborhoods that were most at risk, we would see the largest uh, increases. When we conducted our individual interviews, we actually were very surprised. Again, we saw a few challenges with the fruit and vegetable voucher reported by the vendors. They actually didn't have a big problem with the fruit and vegetable voucher. As other uh, uh, previous researchers mentioned, they had mainly a problem related to size and finding the sizes that were available. That was the biggest challenge mentioned. Also, many of the vendors felt that staff training reduced the problems uh, that they would uh, potentially in, um, that would potentially occur. That a lot of it was alleviated through staff training. But one big issue was the lack of participant knowledge. Several of the vendors talked about the need for more participant training versus vendor training. They felt that the participants needed to be more educated about the project. Uh, about the changes, uh, as well as a language uh, difficulty between some of the vendors and the uh, WIC participants. And I just wanted to give a few examples of, from the individual interviews. One vendor said, I think there should be more lead time out there. Store managers discuss some of the items that were on the list. We don't even carry these. We don't know where the vendor is to get these items. So there was a lot of scurrying that we had to do. So that was one issue. That was a common comment related to size. Uh, as far as participant knowledge, one of the vendors, for example, said, yes, absolutely, because the folks don't know that a can of tomatoes with green peppers is not allowed. Well, how come X amount of this, uh, well, how come I can't get this tomato? I can't get that one. It's only got X amount in, of this in it. It has increased dramatically. I feel it's an educational issue on this end. And what we did is we classified the barriers, and I won't talk in detail because of time, but we classified the barriers as minor barriers um, and then sort of uh, like sort of minor barriers, then barriers that were in between. Uh, but major barriers that could be overcome through either training or some type of assistance, and then what people felt were extreme barriers, barriers that could not be overcome. And it's interesting because a lot of the vendors felt that participant knowledge was a major barrier, that it was some issues that uh, when participants didn't know the proper products that it would cause a conflict at the register and that they felt that that was a major or extreme issue that needed to be addressed. And then also language, because a large uh, percentage of the communities where we uh, surveyed had a large uh, Latino population, but many vendors that were not Latino. So about 40% of the WIC participants I deal with can't even speak English. So they don't understand what the young lady is trying to tell them out there. They're just pissed about the fact that they can't get the cereal they want. So here are again with controversy. So as far as conclusions and recommendations um, from the survey assessment, I know my time is up, so I'm gonna have to move quickly, but um, we think that maybe the change in selection at the larger vendors, but minimal change at the smaller vendors, may be related to the rules in Illinois being more flexible. Um, in Illinois, vendors are only required to have two varieties of canned or frozen. They are not required to have fresh. So many of the vendors may have felt that there was limited need for change because the rules are very flexible and they support vendors, but they may also impact supply. 
Um, and then many challenges related to so sizes and then vendor-client interaction. And we felt that the vendor-client interaction specifically may need to be addressed in training and that potentially vendors and clients can come together and talk about some of the issues to maybe alleviate some of the conflict that uh, vendors were experiencing at the store. We also are asking the same questions from the participant standpoint in individual interviews with participants to see what kind of challenges they're facing at the vendors. So I just would like to acknowledge funding from RWJ, also a grant from USDA, um, from ERS, the Ridge Program, as well as other um, research assistants that worked on the study. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Stacy Gleason. Before I get started, I just want to um, <coughs> mention this study is a little bit different from the others that you've heard and that we did conduct it in four states. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge our partners, the state WIC programs in Colorado, New Hampshire, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. Obviously without them we couldn't have conducted the study. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge my co-investigators Lauren Bell and Ruth Morgan sitting up front and all of the wonderful data collectors at Altarum that helped us with this project. Um, and lastly, mention that it was funded by Altarum. I think you heard from our president, Lincoln Smith, this morning um, that this was one project that fell under our Childhood Obesity Prevention Mission Project initiatives. Um, and the benefit of going last on a panel is that um, the background and need for the study has kind of been covered. So I'm gonna try and spend most of my time on findings, although I'll, I'll cover these things briefly. Uh, when we first heard about the changes to the food package, one concern that came to mind was the impact it uh, might have on small vendors that are typically characterized by having a limited availability of healthy food options, those options that were added to the food packages. Um, and although it does vary by state, there, these small stores do play a very important role, again, varying by state, um, but in some cases, their WIC participants only access to their benefits. So we thought it was really important to focus on small retailers, which we defined for our purposes as stores with one to four registers. We had three goals in mind when we started this project. We really wanted to understand the extent to which small stores were able to maintain their authorization with the WIC program. Um, we also, like many others on the panel, wanted to see what influence this uh, major policy change had on the availability of fresh produce and other healthy foods in these stores. Um, and also wanted to understand the changes small vendors had to make and any challenges they faced in doing so. We, had, uh, we used a multi-method approach, uh, similar methods in some cases to my panel members. We did store, the two of the um, more involved methods that we used were the store inventories mentioned by other panel members and the use of, through the use of the modified NEMS tool. Actually, we, uh, Tanya was nice enough to share her tool with us and we further modified that for our purposes. Um, we conducted inventories at baseline with 275 vendors across all four states and post uh, with 248. So our final sample and what you'll see when I present results are limited to stores that had two data collection periods. And the other um, kind of time intensive and very important method we used was um, interviews, which were done uh, if possible on site when we were doing the inventories. If not, we reached out by phone and you heard about some of the difficulties uh, with reaching vendors that way. And unlike what this slide says, we did not interview all of our stores. That's a copy and paste error. Actually, it was closer to 40 at each uh, time period. And this was a longitudinal design, so we revisited the same stores pre and post. I, I wanna point out some key differences between the states that we included in our study. In fact, we sought states that were slightly different in their implementation of the food package. Um, so you can see here that the, the implementation dates varied some. Colorado implemented early, um, unlike Wisconsin and New Hampshire and Pennsylvania, which were um, at the required October 1 date or just prior to that. Um, what's important to mention here is 
because of our study timeline in Colorado's implementing early, we didn't have baseline data there. So for all intents and purposes, we're kind of considering them a comparison site. Uh, they are not included in a lot of the results that I'll present um, in the remainder of the presentation because we didn't have baseline data. Um, this table summarizes some key differences in the foods that were allowed in each of the states. I'll just point out a few in the interest of time. Um, Colorado didn't allow canned vegetables um, and fruit, which uh, we thought was really interesting because that's the form of produce that's probably easiest for small stores to carry and was most readily available at baseline. Um, also with milk, very interesting that even though the um, interim final rule restricted participants to um, reduced fat or less milk, uh, New Hampshire and Wisconsin took that a step further and limited that uh, participants two years of age and older to skim and low fat. And also, although they're not listed here, there were some key differences in the minimum stocking requirements. We did look at those in each of the four states we were working with. Um, one example is that in Wisconsin, they required stores to carry uh, five varieties of fruits and five varieties of vegetables. Um, unlike the other uh, three states, which only required two of each. And they took it a step further and required that stores carry two varieties of fresh fruits and two varieties of fresh vegetables in Wisconsin. This is a snapshot of our sample. Um, I think if you can see those numbers from where you're sitting, you can see that the samples are quite different across the four states. Um, just to point out a few differences the stores in our Pennsylvania sa sample were much more urban, the stores in our Colorado sample much more rural, and also there were not many one register stores in Colorado. These are by and large a reflection of the overall store characteristics, WIC store characteristics in each of these states, which is why they vary so much. And I also wanna mention in our interviews, we really did um, talk mostly to stores uh, managers of stores with one or two registers because what we learned at baseline is that those stores with three and four registers really were more independent grocery stores, not the convenience and corner store types that tended to have um, lower availability of these foods and were going to face more challenges. So we really wanted to talk to those managers. Jumping into findings, I, I want to, I'm going to present these um, kind of in line with our goals. So. The first goal being we wanted to understand were small stores leaving the program because of the changes. Um, we analyzed, we requested from the states and we analyzed their, author, their list of authorized vendors at six months pre and six months post policy. And this table summarizes that. The, the column with the little triangle indicates the net change from pre to post. Um, I've circled a few data points there to just point out that most of the change that happened was with the smallest retailers, one register stores. It's also important to note that they, those stores tend to have the highest turnover anyway. Um, so to the extent that this is related to the WIC food package change, we can't say. Um, but it's interesting nonetheless that um, in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, they saw you know, a net change in the number of one register stores. There was a decline in New Hampshire, but I should mention an important point, which is New Hampshire was the only state of the four in our study to have a, a moratorium in place, meaning from October 2009 to February 2010, they did not allow new stores to become authorized um, in order to give their vendors and, and themselves a chance to get vendors up to speed with the changes. So this could, this could be artificial. It could just be that these, um, this turnover, um, they kind of couldn't replenish their, their stock, so to speak, of one register stores. Um, to, to try and understand what this all means a little bit um, more, we also conducted brief surveys with the stores in our sample that were no longer WIC authorized when we went back to visit them post-implementation. Um, we ended up, there were 18 stores and out of, you know, across all four states that were not authorized post-implementation at the time of our visit. We were able to conduct surveys with 15 and heard from four of those 15 that they voluntarily left the program because of the food package changes, citing that they had made the changes, um, quite a few changes to their store, and that the foods they had added weren't, was, not, um, was not selling 
and was expiring or going stale before they could sell it. So it wasn't making good business sense for those stores. I want to um, talk some about what, what others on the panel have talked about today, which is the availability of, of um, the new WIC foods. And we looked at this a couple different ways, both through this composite score, which closely mirrors the scoring used by NEMS um, and others. And uh, I want to point out here that basically we saw significant changes in these overall availability and, and produce quality scores across the three states for which we had pre and post data, and, and really only among stores with one and two registers. So that's a trend that you'll see um, as I show you some results by food type. When we looked at milk, the only significant increases we saw were with regards to low fat milk. And again, that was limited to stores in New Hampshire and Wisconsin where we saw those changes. Interestingly, those were the two states that did not allow participants to buy reduced fat milk. Um, and when we looked by store size, this was only significant in, in the smallest stores. Soy milk increased in availability um, across all three study states and in all store sizes. I think it's interesting to point out that in Wisconsin, uh, more than 30% of stores added low fat milk to their inventory. Um, with fruit, um, fresh fruit did increase in all three study states, the availability of fresh fruit. Um, but when we looked at, at this by store size, again, it was um, only in the smaller stores, one and two registers. Uh, less change in the availability of canned and frozen, although there was some significant increases in the availability of frozen fruit in Wisconsin. Vegetables, um, less increases than we saw with fruit, but primarily because they were much more readily available at baseline. There was less room for improvement there. Um, but some significant changes with fresh, primarily in New Hampshire and among the smallest stores. Whole grains is where we saw a lot of change happening. Um, stores in all three study states and in all store sizes, one through four registers, saw significant increases in the availability of brown rice, um, whole wheat tortillas, and whole grain bread. This graph shows the availability of brown rice pre and post. And you can see among one register stores that 40% of one register stores added brown rice to their inventory, which is pretty impressive. We did look at whole grain bread in a 16 ounce package because there was some concern about its availability um, at the time of implementation. This graph shows uh, the availability of whole grain bread post policy. Um, you can see that it's still somewhat limited, but it does vary greatly by state. And I think one point of light here is because we had two rounds of data collection post policy in Colorado, we were able to look at whether the availability of 16 ounce bread increased post policy, and it did. Between four and 12 months, there was a significant increase in Colorado in the availabil availability of 16 ounce whole wheat bread, which you know, may be some indication that um, the, the supply and the manufacturers and the distributors will eventually meet the demand that's out there. Some findings from our interviews with small store managers. Overall, vendors felt very positively about the changes and thought more highly of the program, similar to what we've heard from other um, presenters. Um, all of the interviewed vendors reported that their training, the training provided by the state, was more than adequate. They felt prepared for the changes. 98% reported that they had to make one or more changes to their store, which isn't a huge surprise. Um, but some of the challenges managers reported were uh, their ability to keep food fresh, purchasing and accommodating the new equipment, which is closely tied with keeping food fresh. Um, suppliers limited awareness of the changes and availability of the new foods in allowable forms. Those were heard more um, around the time of implementation. And the increased need to self-supply, um, I think this was primarily around uh, the bread, finding the bread, and in some cases, produce. And then some, some managers reported challenges related to it, customers exceeding the dollar value of the cash value voucher. Although I should mention that in Wisconsin, they do allow participants to use another form of payment over uh, the cash value voucher, but we still heard some, some issues there too. 
So in conclusion, were small stores able to maintain their authorization with the WIC program? I would say generally yes, but with some variation by state um, based on the limited data that we had available. And perhaps that it's too soon to tell. I think vendors, what we heard post-implementation, some were reporting um, a, an influence on their revenue, seeing a decline. And I think a lot of vendors are still feeling out that supply-demand equation, and, and time will tell whether or not it makes good business sense for them to stay authorized. Although my hunch is that they will. We, we heard from plenty of vendors that um, despite any change in their WIC revenues, when WIC customers come in to use their benefit, they shop for non-WIC foods, which is good for the stores. And did the availability of fresh produce and other healthy foods increase among small stores? Yes, again, with some variation by state, um, primarily with stores um, with one and two registers, and some, with some indication that specifically some policy choices that were made by the states could um, influence stores to increase their availability of healthy foods more than others. And lastly, um, you know, small stores did have to make changes, but by and large, uh, were felt very positively about the changes and um, were, were wanting to stay in the program. And that's the end of my presentation. <laughs> now that time's up. <laughs> thank you. Okay, well, thank you to our entire panel. Those were excellent presentations. Um, and I sort of, I can imagine a meta-analysis right now kind of pulling all of these data together because such similar methods were used across the different studies. And one thing that was really highlighted to me that I hadn't thought very much about is the important um, the, the important point of different states having different ways of implementing these standards, which I think really came through, that different states had what may seem like subtle variation, but in fact does have this sort of trickle-down effect into what actually happens in the stores. So I would like to open it up for questions. Hi, I'm Josephine Cialoni. I'm from North Carolina. I wondered if you could speak a little more specifically to the changes you saw in fresh fruit and vegetable availability, particularly in small stores, and link that to the state's policy on what was the minimum inventory requirements for um, vendors. Mm -hmm. Because it, that was just a dilemma we struggled with in our state. And then also, if, if it was a minimum inventory requirement, could you speak at all to the quality of the fresh produce? That's a great question. Um, you know, all of the states that we included did have different minimum stocking requirements when it came to produce in general and fresh produce. Um, off the top of my head, I can't remember all the differences, but some of them set dollar amounts. Um, as you heard with Wisconsin, they had a certain minimum number of types that they had to carry. So it, it's hard to say with only having four states included and all of their minimum stocking requirements varying. Um, but, you know, Wisconsin did seem to have one of the more strict um, minimum stocking requirements related to fresh, and, and we didn't see a difference in the increase in availability of fresh fruit in Wisconsin compared to uh, New Hampshire and Pennsylvania. So I, I don't know how well I can um, speak to that. It is, it is a, a great point. There was a second part of your question. Well, just about the quality. Oh. Vendor, if it was a minimum stocking requirement, you feel that the quality of pulse implementation of those fruits and vegetables or what you would have pulse. Okay. That's, yeah. If it was a minimum stocking requirement in our state, which it is not, mm -hmm. would the quality of the produce would be in those stores? That's a great question. Um, we have looked a little bit at the quality. Um, there are a number of ways that you can look at it. We've kind of to look at whether 75% of the fresh fruit available was um, of acceptable quality. When we look at the quantitative data, there wasn't a strong indication that it impacted the quality. However, anecdotally, having been at the stores, um, particularly Ruth, maybe, is it Wisconsin? Pennsylvania, or Wisconsin. Um, there was a sense that really the quality had declined or the quality of those fresh fruits 
were, were not um, acceptable, you know, based on our assessment of them anecdotally. But I don't know why the quantitative data doesn't exactly show that. Probably there's another way to look at it, and we haven't looked at it all those different ways. So, Anybody else want to add anything? <clears throat> okay. I just briefly. Oh, yeah. Sure. Go ahead. Because we have only uh, our minimum stocking requirements, um, the, the stocking requirements only include two varieties of canned or frozen. We think that that might have had some impact on um, the changes in fresh fruit and vegetable availability post policy. So we didn't see, in contrast to the other studies, we didn't see an increase in fresh and smaller vendors. We only saw an increase in larger vendors. So we think that those stocking requirements had an impact on the smaller vendor availability. And then also when we spoke with the small availability, I mean, when we spoke with the smaller vendors about availability, they felt supported by that because, which is sort of a, an interesting issue because they didn't need to make so many changes and they actually appreciated that. So I think it's, it's a complex issue. Good morning. Um, I'm Pat Graziel from the California WIC program, and I posed this to all of you, actually. I wondered if you had taken a look at the square footage of the stores, particularly the smaller stores, and their ability to make the necessary changes that the, WIC new, the new WIC food package required. No, um, that was kind of an afterthought that we had. <laughs> Having been in the stores, I think that is a really important thing to consider. Um, Obviously, we use one to four registers because it was the most readily available um, indicator of size that we could get from the states. But um, that that would be really important to include, I think, in a true assessment of size. Because I know, and there are one and two register stores that can change dramatically in the actual size of the space yes. available. Definitely. Thanks. Um, I, I just might want to add to that. We didn't have actual measurements of the square footage, but we did do the pre and post focus groups with the vendors, and that was one of the uh, things that we focused on was what they would imagine the barriers might be to um, making these changes and meeting the minimum inventory requirements for Pennsylvania. And in doing the post, um, focus groups, which happened, you know, one year after the changes, uh, it was almost um, almost unanimous among the um, vendors that uh, participated in the focus groups um, that the changes were positive, that they were able to incorporate these changes into what they were doing, and quite a few of them were in the midst of redesigning their stores to accommodate. Um, more of the items that they needed to stock. Is, is anyone here from Hi, I'm Sally again. Um, and this sort of builds on that store size question. And as I think about it, um, in when we think about the vendors, the small vendors, you know, in New York City, we we start right right away thinking of bodegas, and that most of the people coming to shop at those stores and use their their WIC checks are going to be walk-ins. They're going to walk there, as compared to the really large stores where people drive there and can take all of their things and load them in, in the car. So I'm wondering, as you think about the studies that you're doing with vendors, to what extent some of these differences in not just how they stock, but how people are purchasing and using items varies by whether they are walking out with their things or whether they're going to take it out in the cart and load it in the car. I'm thinking about some of the differences between, for instance, fresh versus canned and frozen vegetables and fruits. And whether, what, what should we be thinking about that for states that have both small 
urban foot shoppers versus those who get in the car and drive, say, in our more sparsely populated rural areas. I don't know. <laughs> I don't, that's, a, that's a great point, a great question. Um, it wasn't something that we talked to store managers about in our interviews. Um, and it wasn't something that they raised on their own. Although, you know, the only, th the closest thing I can think to it was, um, would be related to, uh, with suppliers and having to buy in bulk, but it's not directly related to whether participants shop in that way. Um, so I, I can't really speak to that. We, we have looked at how far um, folks live from shopping opportunities and we have that mapped. We've mapped out, you know, distances that they travel to shop. And um, a next step that we're doing is taking a look at changes in their purchasing patterns. So, so we'll be looking at that over um, the next year. Um, so that might address some of that. You know, if you have all those jars of baby food, you know, and you have two toddlers with you or whatever, you know, are you going to be able to walk that quarter mile or do you need to be taking a bus or... So I think it's a really important question. Yeah, I would just add that made me think about another variable, which is how much um, preparation is required of the food. So something like a fresh fruit, you really don't need any preparation, whereas canned or frozen, you probably do, and sort of rice versus bread. And so that is that would be interesting to understand how the availability of the preparation tools among the clients varies and how the stores can best meet their needs. Hi, I'm Phil Kaufman with uh, ERS, and I won't take too long because I see it's just about time for lunch. But I did want to comment on this question of acceptance by vendors of the, of the new WIC food package, and I think um, you know, it's, it's a different scenario for existing vendors than new vendors coming in. And I'm thinking that you might want to look at the post-entry of new WIC uh, applicants to see what the mix of stores is in that group. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of issues that re retailers have to consider when they're looking at modifying their store mix that they have right now. There's a lot of uncertainty about what the returns will be, what the demand will be for those WIC foods. I mean, do they have that kind of information on you know, the WIC um, participants in their area? So there's a lot of questions. And there's some risk involved for the smaller stores, obviously, because they have a business model that they've developed, and they know what, they can, what their sales are, are and their sales mix and to come up and, and to enter into the uh, WIC program and all of a sudden you have all these other products and you have limited shelf space. So there is an impact there and I'd be interested, I think it would be worth tracking for the states to track some of the new uh, stores coming into the program and see what the mix is of those. That's a great point and I think we had really wanted to be able to take a look at that through analyzing the authorized vendor list. I'm just not sure if six months post was the ideal time. Um, you know, you, can, you could see from that table that I showed before that there did seem to be an increase, a net change in the smallest stores, so perhaps they're seeing it as an opportunity rather than a challenge, but yeah, hard to say time with the will, limited data. Time will tell. Yeah, we have few vendors few changes, although we do have some vendors that were in our interview sample that I think only one or two vendors that are no longer in the program. So we have very few vendors, they lost very few vendors between 2008 and 2010, but at least one or two of those vendors are in our interview sample. So we're going back right now to interview the folks that we um, interviewed at time one, and one of the questions is, you know, why did they leave, and what were some of the changes that maybe have, uh, impacted that? Mm 